This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com, and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. I have with me this morning, again, John Rubino, well-known author and publisher of the website DollarCollapse.com. Good morning, John. Welcome back. Morning, Gord. Great to talk to you again. Well, as usual, month goes by quickly. We have a lot of new subjects, and they're always, always subjects we didn't even anticipate we were going to talk about uh, the previous uh, month. So I want to jump right into them, John, because... I think we, we, we may be short here to, of time today, and I don't want that to, to happen. I have up here a list of five articles that you've recently written on. And what I thought we would do is just go through each one of the five with the key messages um, that you were bringing out in the articles. And I'll leave the listeners to actually go through and read the details of the articles. And then, and then if we, with time, debate what they as a group are telling us and maybe our listeners as we go through them can draw their own conclusions as a group what are they telling us there's something new that's changing something that's uh, that's evolving here I have the first one up China yeah China is is a really interesting aspect of the global currency war because they uh, you know they, they were really the, the global economy's success story um, after the 2008-2009 crisis. And part of their success was due to borrowing huge amounts of money. And another part was that they, they pegged their currency, the yuan, to the US dollar. And the dollar was relatively weak for most of the early part of the recovery. But, but in the last year, the dollar got very strong. Basically, the, the US took one for the team, allowing the, uh, the yen and the euro to plunge to help those you know, really weak, really sputtering economies, but it came at a cost. You know, a, a more expensive dollar, a more valuable dollar slows down the U.S., which we'll talk about in a second. But China, because they peg the yuan to the dollar, it, China's also suffering. And their growth is slowing dramatically. They, they keep disappointing um, um, on, on basically every measure of growth. And so everybody's scaling back China's growth predictions for the future. And uh, and they're now under pressure to rejoin the currency war. Either they have to break the peg with the dollar and, and aggressively devalue the yuan, or they have to put up with extremely slow growth and possible um, instability, which is what happens when you're a rapidly developing country and you've got millions of people coming in from the farms who need good jobs in the cities. And if they don't get good jobs, then you've got problems. And that's what China's looking at right now. So it's not clear what they decide. They're, they're kind of creeping into easing, but they, they haven't really begun any kind of aggressive QE program. They haven't broken the link with the dollar um, yet, but we're gonna see something like that from them in the not too distant future, I think, just because they have no choice. They're, they're suffering because they're on the wrong side of the currency war at the moment. There's no question China's suffering from um, their exports are de grow, export demand is slowing in terms of a global demand slow slow down. The whole cost of manufacturing is falling as with robotics, so not needing as much labor labor uh, in in the products, putting pressure on them. Uh, slowing amount of people actually coming from the from the farms or the paddies, if you would, but as you correctly point out, needing to create jobs where the jobs are in many ways shrinking uh, well they're not shrinking they're still growing but at a, a slower growth rate so with that but th that misses the bigger issue john that is in and in, in china their exports are huge but their imports are also huge so in a gdp calculation uh, there's a positive there the big amount in their their uh, gdp is capital investment the flowing of capital the i in the gdp calculation and that is upwards of, has been upwards of 40, 42%, whereas the United States is down in the low teens in that kind of investment. That's slowing, and that is slowing because people are saying, where is the investment 
especially when they think things are too high. That's going to make it very, very difficult to continue to grow GDP and create those jobs. So this is, this is a very difficult problem that I don't think just stimulating with more credit is going to solve, my opinion. Well, yeah, China borrowed something like $15 trillion after 2009 in order to do basically the, the mother of all infrastructure build outs. You know, they built roads and bridges and airports and whole cities. And, and a lot of this wasn't um, wisely chosen. You know, it was it was malinvestment. Where, ghost uh, ghost so, cities. <laughs> yeah, ghost cities where, where, you know, some some local authority decided to build an empire by throwing. Five hundred billion dollars or a trillion dollars at at a, a whole new city, and and you get basically nobody living there now, just empty buildings, and, and so they're not generating the kind of cash flow that they need to pay off this debt, and you know which is a classic Austrian economics event. You know when you when you have too much money, um, you tend to do stupid stuff with it, and that that was kind of China's case where they could borrow unlimited amounts of money because everybody thought they were the world's economic success story. And so they did. They they borrowed more money than any society has in history, and uh, and didn't use it wisely. As much and, as, uh, as much as the developed countries have borrowed, we pale in comparison to the growth of credit in China. Mm -hmm. And our listeners right. need to understand that. And so with this capital investment growth rate slowing, it's not it it's still growing, but the growth rate is slowing significantly. That's why this A Asian investment or infrastructure investment bank has been created. We talked about it last month. They're looking for $54 trillion of capital infusions to come into this bank that's going that's targeted, as the title says, infrastructure. I'm not saying no more ghost cities, but but to build out that they're cons they they see the slowing capital investment. And if we've got slowing liquidity around the world, uh, which I th believe we have a negative negative bonds at five trillion uh, currently outstanding around the world. It's it's a different dynamic that we're they're looking down the gun barrel of, in my opinion. Yeah, when, when you see the numbers that are being tossed around I mean, for um, Asian infrastructure spending, it's it's um, somewhere between um, over optimistic and insane because <laughs> that that's an awful lot of money considering what's already been spent. And, and so you know, I, I don't think we get to the the end point of that process without some kind of global financial crisis because we, you know, we have that coming. And so any number that uh, is projected out a decade or two from here is necessarily going to have to be revised in light of the crazy stuff that happens um, a few years out. So th th there's no real way to know what the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank becomes and, and what it does in the end. But uh, right now they're tossing around numbers that are probably won't happen but that are justifiable in terms of what is needed in Asia. You know, it, it, we, we in the U.S. tend to see the world as, as kind of a um, finished product. You know, all the, the roads are in place that need to be in place, and there's plenty of big buildings, plenty of office space, plenty of factories. Well, that's not the case in the developing world. You know, they, they need all of these things, and in a lot of cases from scratch. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of infrastructure needs, but will there be the capital? To, yep. uh, to to build it out and over there, time. That, that, yeah. that supports that investment because people mm -hmm. don't want the cash coming 20 years from now. I mean, it needs to be generate real dispose, a real cash flow in the, in the short term. John, moving yeah. along here, the second one was the U.S. nearing a recession because the dollar's falling hard. What was the message there? Yeah, well, it's not because the dollar's falling hard. The dollar's falling because the U.S. is nearing a recession. Basically, we, you know, as I said, we, we allowed the dollar to, uh, to soar in the past year. And that, you know, other things being equal, helped our trading partners, but it hurt us. It made our exports more expensive. And in effect, of, of rising currencies like rising interest rates, it makes debts harder to manage, and it, it just makes it harder to... Um, to operate an economy. It makes it a little more expensive to do so, and it's slowing us down. And so we have this one statistic, the labor market, that at least in terms of the top line number is still improving, and that's kind of hiding the fact that everything else is deteriorating. You know, So we've got more jobs, and so they, they can announce unemployment falling, and most economists extrapolate from falling unemployment to rising growth. 
But the fact is, most of the new jobs that we're adding are part-time jobs. In fact, all of them on a net basis. You know, we're actually still losing full-time jobs. And most of the new people being hired are over 55. So you've got people who are going to retire, having to go back to work and getting part-time jobs and nobody else getting much of anything. So that's not the portrait of a growing economy. And you're seeing it in other numbers, you know. Um, Factory output is falling in the US. New factory orders is down. Retail sales are down. These are recession level numbers that we're seeing come out right now. And it looks like the US is not going to grow for the entire first half of 2015. In other words, we're going to have two quarters of zero growth. And this comes um, after six years of incredibly easy monetary policy. In other words, the, uh, the US government basically doubled its debt. We've printed or created electronically huge amounts of new currency, dumped it into the banking system, pushed interest rates down to uh, to near zero almost across the board, and it didn't work. It should have, um, and it would have in any other era of American history, ignited just this, this rip-roaring economic boom, where our biggest problem right now would be that people are making too much money and they're, they're spending it unwisely. But what's really happening now is that uh, hardly anybody's making adequate money and therefore, they're not buying enough stuff. Therefore, you know, our consumer driven economy is starting to sputter. And so all this talk about raising interest rates and, uh, you know, worried about excessive wage growth and stuff like that, that that's going to be walked back or it is being walked back. They're now saying that a uh, June interest rate increase is off the table and it'll happen in September. Well, you know, if it ever happens, it'll just be this symbolic thing because they feel obligated and then they'll have to take it back right away. But more than likely, um, by early 2016, we'll be back in QE mode again. You know, we'll, we'll be back in lowering interest rates, increasing government deficits, and creating huge amounts of new currency at a time when interest rates are already at record lows, when the government debt is already huge, and when uh, lots of segments of um, the private sector um, are already over leverage. You know, corporations have been borrowing incredible amounts of money in the last few years to buy back their own stock. Um, consumers have been borrowing um, extremely large amounts of money to buy new cars, usually on unfavorable loan terms. Um, the, the student loan bubble, everybody knows about that now. That's over a trillion dollars. And the, uh, the default rate on student, student loans is soaring right now. So we're seeing um, signs of stress in the financial markets at the same time the economy is slowing down and at the same time that the uh, the world's central banks don't have a lot of ammo, you know, they normally, uh, after six years of a recovery, they've been raising interest rates a little bit each year. And so they've got interest rates in the four, five, six, seven percent range yep. that they think they can cut. <laughs> but now it's zero or negative in a lot of cases. And so there's no room to cut unless they're going to push interest rates down into extremely negative levels, which is experimental to put it mildly and completely unprecedented. You know, we've never entered a recession with interest rates at record low levels. So who knows what, what happens, but that's, that's what's coming. And so the next year is gonna be fascinating from a theoretical standpoint, because we'll find out if some things are possible or impossible, you know, where, what's the lowest level that interest rates can go to for a capitalist economy to, to function? We don't know, <laughs> but we're liable to find out in 2016. Yeah, negative. We're moving into a world of negative nominal rates. We've been in real mm -hmm. rates where you're going to pay for somebody to store your money. And it's on a road to what I'll call a, a cashless society or war on cash, where you're forced to, to, to put that money into a high risk assets. That all the, the signs are there. John, switching gears, people would say, OK, but the market's doing just fine. You had this article out about high flyers falling to earth in the stock market. I think it was called Canaries in the Coal Mine. Yeah. Part, well, when, by the way, part one, which tells me something about your thinking here. <laughs> well, the um, one of the ways that bull markets end is not, it's not usually all at once. It's a couple of overextended sectors crash. For instance, uh, in the last time around, it was subprime housing, which is actually a really tiny part of the housing market, which in turn is a not that significant part of the global economy. And, but it, it crashed. And then um, 
Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan and, and you know, the rest of the uh, the mainstream economics community came out and said, oh, it's, it's irrelevant, don't worry about it, it's well contained, blah, blah, blah. And it, it wasn't. It ended up spreading to the rest of the global financial system and basically almost blowing up the whole thing. And that's usually how it works. You see a, a couple of uh, overextended industries start to falter and then it spreads to the, you know, the, the main part of the financial system. And so now we should be looking um, at what's happening in, you know, in the markets um, at the margins where the overextended industries are starting to fall. And, and we're seeing that now. And one of the places where that's beginning to happen <clears throat> is in social media. You saw a lot of these companies just soar. You know, they, they were like dot coms where it didn't really matter whether they made money. It was just users. You know, how many people were signing up for their services? So in other words, eyeballs again. And uh, and, and they rose to um, valuation levels that were comparable to the industrial giants out there. You know, they, they were like IBM and GM and, and, and companies like that in terms of market cap. Well, uh, several of them have started to crash now. Twitter, LinkedIn uh, and Etsy. Um, three very high-flying tech companies without predictable earnings, but with a lot of users and a lot of mind share out there, just tanked lately. And so the question is, is are they canaries in the coal mine? Are they, you know, the the sign that financial stress is uh, is bubbling up and beginning to spread to the rest of the economy? And we can't know that until after the fact. But this is how it will look when the system starts to unravel you'll see these high flyers start to tank and then at first that'll be dismissed as irrelevant and then it'll spread and so the question that we need to uh, to answer we need to be paying attention to is uh, will this spread are there going to be other tech stocks that crash and will that carnage spread to the rest of the economy so i, I think it's uh, it's a safe bet that that'll happen in the not too distant future, but wh whether these guys are the catalysts for a broader crisis remains to be seen. The next article was the end is near part three, and you're talking here about the ultimate dumb money, which really springboards from what we were just talking about. Yeah, well, one of the reasons that uh, equities in general are up the way they are with all these other um, underlying bad numbers coming out. You know, if industrial production is falling and, and uh, retail sales are flat, you wouldn't think that corporate profitability would be soaring. And, uh, and you know, it's actually not in, in real terms. Corporate sales are falling and corporate pre-tax profits are down, but earnings per share um, is holding up because companies are borrowing huge amounts of money at extremely low interest rates and using that money to buy back their stock. So they're, they're behaving like typical dumb money at the peak of a cycle. They're borrowing money to buy equities with equities at record levels. Uh, and they, they did this in 2007, by the way. That was the last time corporate buybacks peaked, was right before the crash that uh, shaved 60% off of the average equities value. So if history is any kind of guide to this, then this is yet another sign that we're getting close to the end of this cycle uh, because companies are leveraging themselves to the hilt. They, uh, they can't borrow infinite amounts of money. So this strategy has a, a limited lifespan and they can't buy back infinite amounts of equity because they'll run out of stock. You know, they'll, they'll end up doing um, leveraged buyouts where they buy back all their stock with borrowed money and then their private companies. And for instance, IBM is, is really the poster child for this. And if they have three more years like the last two, they're a private company. They will have bought back all their equity and they'll, they'll just be um, financed with debt. And so most big companies don't want to get to that point, obviously. So the, uh, the corporate share repurchase binge um, has a limited time frame in which to operate. And so the question is, is this year the end or next year or two years from now? We can't know that, but we can know that it won't go on forever. And so at some point, these guys buying back their stock now in order to generate higher earnings per share and a higher share price and therefore get really nice year end bonuses. You know, they'll get to keep those bonuses, but their successors are going to be stuck with a um, 
lot fewer options. You know, they won't be able to keep borrowing money. They won't be able to keep buying back their stock. Their stock probably won't behave that well. And so they're not going to look like the geniuses that these current guys look like. Um, so again, it's a matter of timing. You know, we're seeing all these things that are, um, th that generate positive numbers in the short run, but that can't go on forever. And so it's a question of when it ends, you know, this year, which comparisons with historical levels um, indicate is probable. You know, if, if 2007 is any kind of guide to today, we're done. <laughs> but you never know. And, uh, and so it could go on for a couple of more years, could end now, uh, but it will end. And this is one of the, uh, the really good indicators that we're at the or nearing the end of the cycle when the really dumb money starts behaving like they actually know what's going on. Yeah, and the dumb money find themselves in awkward positions. You're, you mentioned IBM. And uh, they've been a, buying back at a phenomenal rate. Sales aren't there. Margins are not are, are, are not there. But this financial engineering of using writing off debt to buy it back, buy back the shares. And as you say, it's a you know it's almost a a leveraged buyout. But Moody's and the the bond raiders blew the whistle and said, just a minute, that's fine. But your debt to equity now is totally out of line. You've got too much mm -hmm. debt. If you were spinning off free cash flow and buying back your shares, makes a lot of sense. But you're borrowing money, putting it on, on, on the books to buy back your shares. And IBM wants to do it because they, they, their dividends are going up, but they're, it's because the number of shares are going down. So the, the total cash that they're laying out is less. So this financial gig is, is really starting to catch them. And I guess what I'm saying is the runway isn't quite as long as they thought it was. So they're starting mm -hmm. to scramble, though there's a lot of people just joining this buyback because they can't get top line growth. It's not there. So what do you do with the cash that you're, you're spinning off? The last one, John, was again ending, um, uh, the end is near. And this is all these uh, peak trophy uh, assets that you we've talked about before, but some new ones that have come out here recently. Yeah, and and, and this is also symptomatic of yeah, the peaks exactly. of cycle. When 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 you see um, kind of frivolous assets start to be snapped up by people with basically too much money, they don't know what to do with it. You know, the the one percent uh, just has cash flowing in like crazy now because of, of the way the monetary system works. You know, central banks create currency they give to the big banks who in turn give it to their favorite customers one way or another and those guys have to then do something with it well what, what they're doing now is they're buying fine art there, there was just a uh, an auction that brought in 800 million dollars over one weekend and um, the you know the paintings were picassos and warhols and, and there were a few statues by uh, famous sculptors and and uh, they, they all set records and that's the kind of thing that you, you know, you see at the peak when uh, when people with huge amount of amounts of cash don't really want to just buy equities anymore. They, they see that bonds aren't a good deal and uh, they don't know what else to do with it. So they start buying trophies, you know, things that they figure, well, there will never be another Picasso made. So therefore, you know, the, the, the scarcity is going to make it more valuable over time. So I'll pay whatever it takes, you know, and, and when you get a whole bunch of billionaires doing that, you get insane prices. And that's what we're seeing now. Fine art is absolutely through the roof. Uh, meanwhile, there are a record number of one hundred million dollar plus homes being sold. In other words, the, the ultimate trophy real estate, these these palatial estates in um, expensive places are being snapped up by billionaires from around the world uh, and um, real estate in hot areas in general is going up you know in, in in silicon valley the average price of a house now or the, the median price is nine hundred thousand dollars you know the average income is fifty or sixty thousand dollars there and yet the average house costs more than ten times that so that's also the kind of thing you see at the very, very peak of a market. And we saw it in 2007, we saw it in 1999, and we're seeing it again. So will it end differently this time? <laughs> you know, John, it, John, it will and in a much bigger way because this is, I won't call this the smart money, but this is the rich top 1% or 2%, 5% of society that are putting their money in these, op, in, in these items, items at extremes. But when we look at all the institutions that don't typically go and buy art and don't typically buy all of these 
exorbitant kinds of items there because they have fiduciary responsibilities they have to put it into things like bonds and that's why you've got five trillion dollars of bonds at negative interest rates they got no place they, there's so much money they're just trying to put it somewhere where they're willing to pay you to keep the money because they want it back and there's even if they're going to take less back at least they're going to they think they're going to get it back when you that's what five trillion dollars in negative nominal bonds means mm -hmm. uh, we didn't we saw short-term money go negative as you recall during the 2008 financial crisis right where all of a sudden everybody flooded into treasuries and that that's what they're doing with the sovereign uh, sovereign debt most people don't understand we have a bigger bond bubble than we do a stock market bubble right now but it, that's an example of fear they see something coming or minimally, it says there's no place to put the money to get where they'll take a negative yield. So it's broad based. That's what I'm trying yeah. to say. It's, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Right, it's everybody but the working man and the middle class who have no money. Mm -hmm. They don't have any. Yeah. They don't have any. And, all they can do is increase their debt. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they want most of us to borrow lots of money to buy stuff. And they want people with capital to move way out on the risk spectrum. This is conscious government policy here because they, they, they're they chasing what's called the wealth effect, which is uh, the, the process by which if your stocks and bonds go up in value, you feel richer and then you're willing to borrow money to buy stuff. And the, the buying stuff part is what Keynesian economics is all about. They want us to buy things to generate aggregate demand, which makes the economy grow. And, and uh, in, in that theoretical framework, that's the holy grail. You know, if you've got people buying stuff and the economy's growing, don't worry about the balance sheet, don't worry about anything else, you're okay. But that, and, John, John, that was absolutely valid thinking in the 80s and earlier, probably the 90s, maybe mid through the mid 2000s, possibly. But the middle class doesn't have money they're not investing in the stock market other than in their if they have a pension plan through their they it's not in 401ks and IRAs of any magnitude so the money's not is not being in, is not being invested at all right now so so that and that's the investment that gives the consumption cuz real disposable income is shrinking so it the wealth effect is only for the top percentage and they typically don't spend money uh, uh, be, uh, on all the consumption items that the 70% consumption economy lives on or, or creates. So that's why the different, the Wall Street separated from Mainstream is so significant because we've got it, the natural goose that laves the golden egg, my, my humble opinion. Am I, am I right on that? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, right, right now, the average person has very little in the way of savings with which to invest. And um, but the people who do, the people who are trying to save are being forced further and further out on the risk spectrum. Exactly. And, you know, you could you could say that that's really inept government policy or you could say uh, that it's part of a conscious plan to siphon the remaining wealth out of the middle class before the system falls apart and it has to be reset. I don't know. You know, it, it, it could be either one of those things. And I'm not sure which one is more scary. But that, that's clearly the process that's at work right now. You know, government policy is forcing people with no money to borrow and people with a little bit of money to take excessive risks. And so, you know, obviously it all blows up on us at some point because it always does when you get to this level of, of uh, financial craziness. But um, when is the question and uh, and what happens after? You know, I mean, clearly we're going to. Um, have some kind of a crisis in which a lot of this excessive risk is wiped out. But we can't know necessarily when that's going to happen. And we can't know the shape that um, the, the, the system that we put in place afterwards takes. So um, about all we can do as individuals is take care of our own situation as best we can. And that is that, that means to the extent that we have capital to invest, investing in things that aren't going to blow up when the financial system goes. And that means, you know, long term bonds, catastrophic, avoid them. Um, high flying equities, same thing. You know, you, you could see another year or two of central bank buying where, uh, you know, Japan's central bank doubles its $100 billion equity position 
and forces up equities for a little while longer. But then you get into valuation levels that uh, that guarantee a, a collapse at some point. So equities are out also. And uh, and so it, it gets harder and harder to decide where to put your money. But I, I think precious metals are one place that, uh, that that will do well over time as this unfolds. But there aren't a lot of others, you know, well chosen real estate is OK. But if it's leveraged, then then you've got a leveraged asset at a, at a time of financial crisis. And and that's really dicey. So uh, this is a really tough situation for the average investor, or the average saver, because uh, government policy is actively hostile to your interests. And there's nothing. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I apologize. You're, uh, OK, well. OK, I was just going to say there's nothing you can do about it politically. So all you can do is try to structure your life so that you're as um, as protected from what's coming as possible. And even that is getting tougher and tougher. John, when we put these five together, these are clearly where the road that we're going on with the points you just made. But is there are the five of these signaling anything that's changed in the last 60 days, 90 days? Is there a theme that's starting to come out from when we look at all these five articles together? Yeah, it's, it's that this isn't working. <laughs> these guys have, uh, have basically created more currency in the last five years than has ever been created in history, taken on more debt that's ever been taken on in, uh, in history, and lowered interest rates to levels where they've, they've never been before on a, a broad basis. And it didn't work. We don't have the rip roaring recovery that we should have, according to Keynesian economic theory, with with this kind of a macro environment. And so the fact that it didn't work means we have to try something else. And there aren't any tools left that are obviously right there and and uh, and have a high degree of uh, high possibility of success. So we're, we're so far into uncharted territory that now we can't even talk about what experimental things we're going to do next because nobody really knows. And so the next few years um, are, are going to see a lot of people pulling things out that uh, that would have been labeled as either physically impossible or um, so dysfunctional as to be crazy. Negative, and the war on cash. How, how about negative nominal interest rates? Yeah, yeah, across the, the board. On, I mean, and the war on cash. Yeah, but see, the war on cash is really the next stage here is where if they need to move interest rates down to from, you know, 0.5 percent to negative 3 percent, let's say. How do you do that while people own cash? Because they'll just take their money out of the bank and exactly. then they'll just transact with cash. And so you're seeing calls from all of these mainstream sources for the elimination of cash, you know? And that's, again, that's another one of those things where 10 years ago, if you'd asked a bunch of economists if we would see that in our lifetimes, they would have said, nah, you know, maybe we'd like to see it, but there, it'll never happen because it's just, uh, it's too crazy with too many um, unintended consequences possible when you do something like that. Well, you know, now, now it's a mainstream idea. Now countries are considering it. Um, States in the U.S., cities in the U.S. are, are looking at various restrictions on cash um, to make it less and less attractive to do that kind of transacting and to force us all into electronic accounts. And um, this has obviously a lot of economic impacts that uh, that I would say are, are really negative, but it has a lot of uh, political aspects to it, too, that are really scary because that's our last private transaction capability you know with cash you can you can buy something from somebody with a, a stack of 20s and nobody knows it happened or the, at least there isn't a record of it uh, immediately being transmitted to the NSA but you put us all on electronic accounts where all of our money is in brokerage accounts or bank accounts and it's all happening via plastic or our cell phones then everything we do is tracked and recorded in real time you know, and then, and then combine that with all the cameras and the microphones that are in our electronic devices that the, the NSA can turn on and off at will. <laughs> and 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 privacy is kind of dead and um, individual freedom is, is kind of dead at that point, because if uh, if they can just turn off your bank account because you are espousing a political philosophy that the, the current government doesn't like or backing a candidate that they uh, they find threatening or whatever, you know, and doing anything that the guys in charge don't like, if they can just take all the money out of your bank account and there's nobody for you to call because the, the guys you would normally call are the ones who did it, 
Uh, that's a scary world. You know, that's a uh, Brave New World 1984 situation with much better technology than uh, than the writers of those books envisioned. So that, again, is what we're headed for. We've got a financial crisis in the near term and then this kind of turnkey totalitarian state that technology is enabling right now and that public policy is furthering coming after that. So this is a very scary world. And it's one in which the conversation that we have about this stuff is is way more important than the conversation that we're currently having about immigration or you know social issues or or you know, tweaky kinds of economic policy where we just change something at the margin. That's what today's election debate is about. Well, the the next debate is going to be a lot more profound and a lot more important. So we need to uh, prepare for that. You know, get our arguments lined up and and be ready to make an articulate case for constitutionally limited government, individual freedom, um, and private sector driven economic growth. You know, that, those are the things that, uh, that make a system work. And we need to be able to, uh, to make the case that that's what we need to go back to when the current set of systems and current set of policies blow up on us. What's the chance of that happening? Not the blow up. <laughs> The blow up is for sure the uh, Others. Uh, us re rebuilding something constitutionally sound out of the rubble, maybe 10 percent. Out of the rubble. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. doing it before the crisis, slim to none. No. Yeah. The system has to uh, play itself out. You know, the institutional momentum now is such that we're, we're heading off that cliff. And uh, the question is, what do we build after we hit? You know, and that's. That's the interesting part of the story and the scary part of the story, because it's not clear that uh, that the you know the libertarian ish side of the argument wins this next debate at all. John, you know, just a little closing point from my perspective on where, what these five articles are are telling me. You know, I spent most of my career in large scale corporations, uh, manufacturing, supply, demand. Uh, forecasting, this sort of thing. And what I see is that quantitative easing over the last six years, one, two, three, has, always, has been, and debt is about bringing demand forward. So we've taken future demand and been able to make it affordable today to drive consumption up. Hasn't been tremendously successful, but it has kept the wolf away from the door. But cheap money doesn't just allow people to buy. What it allows, and this is an old manufacturing, it allows you supply to go up, not the supply. So you can, manufacturing suddenly gets, can be cheaper. Uh, more people enter the market. So the manufacturing just explodes, as we've seen in Asia, to fill this demand that's, that, that's there. But eventually what happens is supply actually will go up higher than demand. But let's say they reach a, an elevated level. But how do you bring more demand for it? Quantitative easing for going to bring more demand forward? So what happens is demand starts to, well, not slow, still growing, but not as much. So suppliers, the supply side, cut commodities, cut lead times, cut late, are cutting labor feverishly because when supply is high, they've got to fight competition. So labor is cut and has been dramatically through this, this, this whole process. The problem when labor is cut that's where the demand comes from. It's the consumer that buys. It's the it's the middle class. So the demand demand side suddenly starts to accelerate, and I see that's what's happening. And more credit is not happening, especially when all that credit was based on collateral, where the asset values are going to start to fall. And it, so you just kind of kind of go up over a hill. It's why trees don't grow to the sky. Eventually, the they reach a point of instability. And I see these are all signs of potential instability. It does not mean something is imminently about to happen because the powers to be are going to keep trying to keep that, pushing that a little bit forward. But we've never made a tree grow through the sky, have we? It just eventually yeah. runs out of, and especially when these are all te untested means. So, yeah. you know, that's, that to me, it's pretty straightforward. And when I look from the Baltic dry, when I look at what's happening in China, uh, when I see the consumers, and this morning, uh, we're, we're looking at the Michigan sentiment plummeting, and it's been just plummeting. Where people are, we're talking about these great job numbers. People are saying they're concerned about having a job in the next five years. That's the kinds of what they're seeing inside their 
their job environment as the, as the pressures are more mounting more and more and never mind having a disposable income. So I think these are real clear signals of what's on the horizon. It doesn't tell us about timing, but it tells, you know, and as an investor, you don't really need that. You just need to know where it's going and make sure you're insured properly. Yeah. It, yeah, and that you don't use leverage in the short run. <laughs> well, it's the, it, the leverage is the problem because the bond yeah. market right now, that is all that leveraged is out. All that debt has been leveraged up, and as soon as it falls, it's called a margin call. And mm -hmm. if and if you don't have that, you're you're in deep deep trouble. And we have a five hundred trillion dollar swaps market that's based on interest and currency uh, uh, swaps that are all leveraged up. And so any kind of increase in interest rates, any increased problems with the bond market and, or collateral in any way, you got margin call and there's no collateral available. There's no high mm. quality. That's why high yield junk is demanding what it is today. That's the problem. And that's what brought down 2008. It was a collapse in the short term borrowing of asset backed commu commercial paper. And now it's all repos, collateralized transformations, etc. We have the same issue uh, today. We'll we'll see what unfolds. I anyway, I want to give my two cents worth here too the, this morning. John, can you tell our listeners where they could learn more about your uh, your work and your and your writings as you wrap today? Sure, I run dollarclaps.com, which covers on a continuously updated basis the stuff we talked about today. And then uh, my latest book is The Money Bubble, co-written with Gold Money's James Turk, that uh, covers this stuff in more depth and uh, and talks also in depth about uh, how you can invest to protect yourself from what's coming. Boy, do we ever need some some roadmaps of what to do. And I know you spent a lot of time, you and James, in writing that book and laying out ideas that people need to give some consideration to with a good financial advisor on uh, to prepare themselves for these potential problems we're talking about here today. Talk to you again next month. Look forward to it, Gordon. Thanks. Always talk to you. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.